the book of Jeremiah in the Word of God. Jeremiah chapter 33 is where we'll be. Jeremiah chapter 33. Jeremiah chapter 33. It's been a busy day. It's been a good day here at Bible Baptist Church. We had several of the preachers from around the area call in and tell us they couldn't be here. But then there were several others that came, so that was a good deal, a good, a good thing, and we enjoyed the fellowship and enjoyed meeting together around the Scripture and being challenged by it. Boy, the Word of God is just always good, it's always sweet, it's always relevant, it's always helpful when we open it up and we rightly divide its truths. Jeremiah chapter 33 is where we are. I wonder if, the, if you're able, could we stand as we read? We're just going to read one verse, a very familiar verse. But I would invite you to keep your Bibles open as we look to the Scripture and see what the Word of God has for us. Jeremiah chapter 33, the Bible says in verse 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Help us, fathers, we look into this portion of Scripture. We need your help tonight. And I pray that you'd give it to us. I pray that you'd speak to us in a great and a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for standing. You may be seated. As we come to this portion of Scripture, it's a verse that many of you have learned. Some of you, as I was reading it, were singing a song that you had learned that had that won't goes along with this verse, and that's that's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing to commit verses like this to memory, and if you got to use music to do it, that's even better. But the truth is, there is there's power in this verse. Before we look at it in, the, in a little bit of detail, I want us to understand the context. I want us to understand where Jeremiah was when he wrote these words under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible doesn't hide this from us; it makes it very plain. Notice what it says in verse. 1. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the second time, notice, while he was yet shut up in the court of the prison. Now, when it says Jeremiah was shut up, that doesn't mean that he was not speaking. That means he was incarcerated. Okay, He was behind bars. Why was he behind bars? Well, he had uh, he had done several things, but the most notorious was he had preached the Word of the Lord. He had gone to the, to the men of Judah and he said, listen, you've been living in idolatry, you've been living in sin, you've been living in iniquity, and you better get right with God. If you don't get right with God, the Chaldeans are going to come. They're going to encamp around the city of Jerusalem. They're going to besiege the city and you will not be able to get out. And uh, and if you stay in this city, you're going to die by the sword or you're going to die by the famine. If you get out of this city and surrender to the Chaldeans, at least they will spare your life. And so on and on he preached. He was preaching the Word of God, but they wanted nothing to do with it. So much so that they came to Jeremiah and they grabbed him and they threw him down in a pit. There was a man by the name of Abed-Melech that came and got him out of the pit and saved his life, he would have died a slow, painful, agonizing death, sinking slowly into the mire of that dried up well. But ebed Millen came and got him and they decided, well, we're not going to throw him back in that, in that prison, but we'll make another prison, a building in Jerusalem, and there we will keep this man named Jeremiah. And so that's where Jeremiah was when Nebuchadnezzar's army finally broke the wall down of the city and when he finally prevailed against Jerusalem. So in this portion of Scripture, he is in the court of the prison. I wish I had time to tell you the work that God has done in my heart because of Jeremiah chapters 32 and 33. But suffice it to say, in chapter 32, God comes to Jeremiah and says, I'll tell you what I want you to do. I want you to buy this field, and I want you to take the evidences of the purchase, and I want you to to set them up because houses and lands are going to be sold here again. And Jeremiah said, well, Lord, that all sounds good, but i got to tell you, you have uh, prophesied, you have caused me to prophesy at your your word, and by your hand that the city is going to be broken up. And now you're telling me that houses or lands are going to be sold here again? And the word of the Lord to Jeremiah personally in Jeremiah 32 and verse 27 is powerful. He says to him, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I want to tell you something. There are times when you and I are looking around at the circumstances of life. There are times that we are wondering what is going to, uh, to become of this situation. i got to tell you, as I look around at a country, I don't know where I am anymore. 
Somebody in a public school in the United States of America put, put up this sign in their public school classroom. Welcome to America, spelled A-M-E-R-I-K-K-A. I'm not really sure what they're trying to say by that, but it makes me a little nervous, Brother Forsberg. I just don't know. I just don't know. But the, the, I don't know about those things, but I do know that we serve the God of the impossible. I do know that. God came to Jeremiah and said, Jeremiah, yeah, things are bad right now. Things are, if you want to know how bad it was in the siege, read the book of Lamentations. If you're reading the book of Lamentations and you read something in the book of Lamentations and you think to yourself, no, that can't be saying what I think it's saying. It probably is. In the book of Lamentations, you will read about cannibalism. Not because they're natives in some South Pacific island somewhere, but because women were so hungry they ate their own little babies. That's how bad it got. You'll read about that in the book of Lamentation. But here we are in the book of Jeremiah chapter 33. The city has not yet been broken up, but Jeremiah is in prison. What is happening to him? Well, the Bible says while he was in prison, note verse 2. Verse 2 is very interesting to me. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, the Maker thereof. The Lord that formed it to establish it. The Lord is His name. <laughs> Not a whole lot of doubt as to who's given this message, is there? I mean, the Lord, the Maker of it, the Lord that established it, the Lord is His name. This is a message from Almighty God. Okay, so what's the message? Well, we've read it. Let's look at it again. Call unto me, He says. It's a command. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, God says and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now let's think about this structure for a moment. The command is there, call unto me, and then right on the heels of that command is a promise. Now, this occurs many times in the Word of God. You have a, a promise. We looked at this, and uh, we looked at this Sunday night. We looked at this. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So you have a command, and it's accompanied by a promise. Now, here's the way that works. If you or if I obey that command, then we can claim the promise. Does that make sense? Alright, so we come to God, according to this verse of Scripture, God is telling Jeremiah, Jeremiah, call unto me. What does it mean? It means pray. It means uh, have a time that you come and bring your request before me. Call unto me, and the promise is, I will answer thee. Now, logically, if Jeremiah did not call, God would not answer. Everybody okay with that? That kind of makes sense, doesn't it? If you don't call, I'm not going to answer. This is pretty simple. But then I want you to notice the promise goes on. Call unto me, I will answer thee. And notice this, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Now, if I understand the Scripture tonight, if Jeremiah would not call on the Lord, there was some truth that God would not reveal to him. Does that make sense? If you do call, I will show you great and mighty things, God says. So, if you don't call, then you're going to go on in the dark. Isn't that interesting? Now, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want, to, I want us to think of it in a sense of intercessory prayer tonight. I'm going to show you why I believe it, it talks about intercessory prayer. But uh, I, I just want to talk a minute about what do we mean by intercessory prayer. Many times when you pray and when I pray, we're praying for ourselves. Lord, I've got, I've got this that I have to do today. I need wisdom. There's nothing wrong with praying for wisdom. God never upbraids us, Brother Rob, when we pray for wisdom. That's what the Bible says. We can come to Him 40, 50 times a day saying, Lord, I need wisdom again. Would you give me wisdom again? And you know what? He's going to give it liberally, the Bible says. But many of the times when we pray, we pray for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with praying for ourselves. But intercessory prayer is when I lay aside my needs and my burdens, and instead, I come to God on behalf of somebody else. What does it mean? It means, for example, in my case, I pray for loved ones that, as far as I know, are unsaved. Well, that's intercessory prayer. 
I'm talking to many people out here. There are people that you know and love and hold dear. They're not saved or perhaps they're away from God. And you bring their needs before the Lord all the time. I want you, I want you to think of Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 in the context of intercessory prayer. Call unto me, God says, and I will answer thee. Well, we kind of know that, but more importantly, there are things that you don't know right now that you can only know if you call upon me. That's what he's saying. Now, I want us to look at the, at the following context of this great verse. Because following the, in the context of this verse, we can begin to see some things that God wanted to do for Israel. And I believe that they were only revealed to Jeremiah because he prayed. And had he not prayed, these might never have been revealed. But he did pray, and God revealed some things. I wonder what might happen when you and I get serious about interceding. I wonder what might happen if we were to get together and just, and just have a, a, a serious season of prayer. I wonder what might happen. Call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Would you look at verse 4 please? The Bible says, For thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the houses of this city and concerning the houses of the kings of Judah, which are thrown down by the mounts and by the sword. Now let's explain that. In a siege... They would come in, Micah, and they would build up this great big wall of dirt. And they would build up the wall of dirt so that they could walk across the wall of dirt onto the wall and then break the wall down. So they had different things. The Bible says there were houses, of, they were on the wall, there were houses of the kings of Judah, and these houses that were on the wall had already been thrown down by the mounts. That's things that the, the Chaldeans are bringing up. They're getting close enough to the wall and they're smashing it. Maybe it's battering rams, we don't know, but it's, it's throwing it down. And the Bible says, the houses of the city, the houses of the kings of Judah have been thrown down by the mounts. God says, I've got a message about those. Look at verse 5. They, by they, He means Judah. Judah, they come to fight with the Chaldeans. Well, that's logical. The Chaldeans are attacking their city. So the Jews are rallying together and they're saying, let's go and let's fight with the Chaldeans. They come to fight with the Chaldeans, God says. But it is to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I have slain in my anger and in my fury and for all whose wickedness I have hid my face from this city. Now, this is not surprising if you've read the book of Jeremiah. It's all over the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah is prophesying the doom and the destruction of Jerusalem. And so here again, after God says to him, Call unto me and I will answer thee, show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. He said, I want to tell you something about the houses of the kings and the houses that are on the wall. They've already been thrown down. Some of them they haven't been totally destroyed, but it's only a matter of time. And God says to Jeremiah, you and I both know that. And so, he says, the Jews are coming to fight, but they're only going to fill these houses with the, the, the dead bodies of men. He said, they're going to fight against the Chaldeans. It's not going to go well. I just want you to understand that. That's nothing new. But all of a sudden, as you read down in the text, verse 6, there's an abrupt change. I, don't, I wasn't ready for it. You aren't ready for it. Jeremiah wasn't ready for it. But suddenly, we shift gears abruptly from a message of gloom and destruction and the houses being filled with the dead bodies of men. All of a sudden, God is about to reveal something totally different. It is a totally uncharacteristic message for, uh, compared to what Jeremiah has been asked to deliver. And I wonder to myself as I read this, might this message only have come to Jeremiah? Because he prayed. I want you to look at the, the text very carefully. Note, note verse 6. Now God has just talked about dead bodies in the houses that have been pulled down. But in verse 6 He says, Behold, I will bring it. That's the city now. I will bring the city health and cure. Wow. Call unto Me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. There's going to be death. There's going to be destruction. The city's going to be broken apart. The, the houses are going to be full of the dead bodies of men. But Jeremiah, I'm going to bring the city health and I'm going to bring it cure. Wow. What a time for such a message. 
You understand the Chaldeans are still outside the walls. You understand every single day that the Jews get out of bed, they can hear the Chaldeans building yet another siege engine, another means of breaking down the walls. They know what this is going to be. Inside the walls, there's no bread left in the city. People are eating unspeakable things. You can read about those in the book of Lamentations. All of this is going on. And God comes to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, it's time to pray. Call unto me. I will answer thee. I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And Jeremiah, when you do pray, he's got some things to reveal. I want you to notice, number one, God promises to recover His people. He promises to, to recover His people. Notice again the words, I will bring the city health and cure. And I will cure them, he says. Right now, the city is sin sick. Right now, it's a wash in iniquity. Right now, all of, all of the, all of the, 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 the punishment for their sin and their poor choices is falling from heaven on the Jews. It looks as if there is no hope. It looks as if there's nothing to be done. But God says, Jeremiah, you call on me and I've got some things to reveal to you. Number one, I'm going to recover my people. I want you to understand tonight, my dear friend that spends time in intercessory prayer, you realize that the person you're praying for tonight, God wants to recover them. You see, we have a God, we have a God that is in the business of curing the sickness of sin. We have a God that, that, that knows what an awful disease sin is, but He's in the business of bringing a cure. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You understand sin is an awful sickness. Isaiah 1, 5 and 6, the Bible says this, the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even under the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed up, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. That's the language that God uses of sin. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody here tonight and, and, and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. I want you to understand, every single person that's ever born into this world is a sinner. You're a sinner. I'm a sinner. That's the bad news. But the good news is, from the beginning of all time, as soon as sin came into the world, God immediately began to seek out sinful man so that He could recover him of the sickness of sin. If you're here tonight, maybe you you know Jesus Christ is Savior, but you're away from God tonight. I want you to know that God is in the business of recovering man of their wickedness and of their sin. My dear intercessor, I want you to realize these are truths that we can only fully understand when we come into the place of prayer and call upon Him. Not only does He say, I will recover My people, but I want you to note what the Bible says in verse 6. He says, I will, I will bring it health and cure. I will cure them. And then He says, I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. Isn't that beautiful? I will reveal unto them the abundance of peace and truth. Can I tell you something? Not only does God want to recover His people, He wants to reveal His truth. He wants to reveal His truth. God says, I'm going to tell you, Jeremiah, you're getting down on your knees and you're praying for this, this nation. I mean, the words, the words that Jeremiah used in other places, ah, sinful nation. A people laden with iniquity, he said. He asked the question, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is the sin of the daughter of my people not cured? And on and on it goes. Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. On and on Jeremiah goes. On and on he went in his message. And it seemed as if everyone were not paying him any attention. It seemed that they were turning deaf ears. In fact, they stoned other, they didn't stone him, they imprisoned him. They tried to kill him on different occasions. They took the words of God that he gave them and they cut it with a penknife and they threw it in the fire. That's what Jeremiah had to deal with in his ministry. And yet, through all that, the God of heaven comes to him and says, Jeremiah, call unto me, and I will answer thee. And I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. You see, Jeremiah, this wicked people, this people that have turned their back on me time and time again, I want to bring them health and cure. I want to recover my people. But this wicked people that have rejected me so many times, I want to reveal to them my peace and my truth. I want you to understand something. There can never be peace until the individual embraces truth. You see that there? Look at it in verse 6 again. God says, I will reveal unto them the abundance 
of peace and truth. You know why we have people who are not at peace? Because they won't accept the truth. That's just the way it is. You say, Brother Paul, I'm not sure about that. Well, listen to the words of God in, in uh, Psalm and verse 85. Psalm 85, excuse me, verse 10. Psalm 85 and verse 10. The Bible says, Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. And what does that mean? That means if you want to be at peace, you got to get right with God. That's what it means. That's just what it means. It's just that simple. And we've got people today that they long for peace. They, 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 long, to, they long to have a quietness in their heart and a, from, the, from, from the, the noise and, and all of the cacophony that surrounds them. But they won't get right with God. That's the only way to have peace. The songwriter put it this way. You've longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase and you've earnestly, fervently prayed, but you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. That's just the way it goes. And so God is coming to Jeremiah. And God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I want you to get down on your knees. I want you to intercede. I want you to call unto me. Because when you do, I will answer thee. I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What things, Lord? Well, I'm going to show you how I want to recover my people. I want to show you how I want to reveal my truth. Let's keep going. Verse 7. I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. What's he saying there? He's saying not only will I recover my people and reveal my truth, but I will regather my people. I will regather my people. If you read the story of the the history, uh, the, the history rather, excuse me, of the book of the Bible, you will understand that the ten northern tribes of Israel they were taken captive by the Assyrians. That's approximately 722 BC. And the Bible says that the Assyrians brought in other nations and they repatriated them in the land of Israel. Today that would be the area around the, uh, the Sea of Galilee. That would be the northern area of Israel, not far from modern day Tel Aviv and, and Haifa and so forth. And so that, that area at one time was the ten northern tribes. But the ten northern tribes disobeyed God. And so they were carried into captivity. And, they, and other people came in. There was an an intermingling of the Jewish people with pagans. That created a race of people known as the Samaritans. We've read about the Samaritans in the New Testament, haven't we? We read in John chapter 4, the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Why was that? Because the Samaritans, some of them were Jews who had married pagans and had intermingled the Lord's people with pagan people. Not only did they do that in a racial uh, uh, way, they did that in a religious way according to 2 Kings chapter 17. The Bible says they, uh, they served the Lord, but they also brought in the gods of, of the lands that they had been from. And so they served the Lord on one hand, and yet they fell down to idols on the other. It created all kinds of confusion. And, and furthermore, as time would go on, the Jews would be spread literally all over the world, and yet the promise of God is this, Jeremiah, you call unto me, I will answer thee, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And one of those great and mighty things is this, I'm going to regather my people. And I want you to know that when, when God's people, when, when those, who, well, those who go away from God, God wants to bring them back. I don't think, I, I don't think we always remember that. I think sometimes we wonder, well, maybe have they gone too far? Can I, ju can I just answer that question? Have they gone too far? No! They haven't. They haven't. Because deep in the heart of the holy God of heaven beats a desire to bring them back. To bring them back. Jeremiah, call unto me. I will answer thee. Jeremiah, I'm going to show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. What things, Lord? Well, I want, to, I want to recover my people. I want to reveal my truth. I want to regather my people. I want you to notice something else. Look what the Bible says in verse 7. The Bible says, I will cause the captivity of Judah and the captivity of Israel to return. And then notice, and will build them as at the first. What is God saying? Jeremiah, you call unto me, I'll answer thee, I'll show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Like this, 
I want to recover my people. I want to bring them health and cure. I want to reveal my truth. I want to regather my people. But I want you to notice number four, I want to restore my people. Look at the words that he uses. He says, I and will build them as at the first. How did God build Israel at the first? Well, it was the time of a lot of miracles, wasn't it? At the first. How did that all work out? Well, that worked out something like this. God, at the first, decided that uh, Moses was going to go to Pharaoh. Remember the story? Let Thus saith the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey Him? Big mistake. Right? Big mistake. Big mistake. Who is the Lord that I should obey Him? Well, He's the God that can turn the Nile River into blood. Are you convinced? No, not yet. He's the God that can make frogs appear in all your house. Are you convinced? No, I'm not convinced yet. I'm always amazed that Pharaoh came to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to entreat the Lord that He'll take away the frogs tomorrow. We're going to spend one more night with these frogs. I can't imagine anything like that. There have been times in my marriage when my wife has pulled back the sheets and there has been a spider in our sheets. Look, you would have thought, you would have thought that the entire armies of illegal aliens crossing the border had set up camp in our house. It's just a spider. It's about, I don't know, its body is about as big as my, my fingernail there. Now, in her defense, in her defense where I live, we have a tremendous concentration of brown recluse spiders. Okay, I don't know if y'all, I don't think y'all have them in South Dakota, but they have a bite that is poisonous to man. Sometimes they bite you and the skin will begin to rot. And oftentimes by the time you realize, oh no, something is wrong, it's been weeks since the spider bit you. Okay, they're a little, they're a lot scary. I find them in my shop all the time, all right? So in her defense, she didn't know what kind of spider it was. It didn't give name, rank, and serial number, all right? But, uh, but I tell you what, one little spider in there, and my wife just about went, ah! you got to kill it! you got to kill it! you got to kill it! Oh, not on the sheets. What? What am I supposed to do? I haven't told her this, but I found a South Dakota spider in our sheets just the other day. But I killed it without telling her, and I didn't squish it on the sheets either. Anyway, uh, I can't imagine her reaction to pull the sheets back and it's full of frogs. I, I don't know. I've been in Florida before where the frogs get in our slide out. And they get in every single crevice in the trailer. And when you, you go to pull in the slide out, you... <laughs> it's just not a pretty sight. But the Bible says he wanted one more night in sin. One more night with those frogs. Don't take them away tonight. Take them away tomorrow. So I can spend the night with them one more time. I don't understand that. But you know what? You'd think that by the time they got to plague number, I don't know, four, five, six the Pharaoh would be convinced, but he wasn't. He wasn't convinced. Finally, God came to him. The, the Egyptians worshipped a multiplicity of gods, but one of their greatest gods was the sun god. And for three days, it was dark in all the land of Egypt. You'd think at least by that point, somebody would say, hey, we've we got to quit this. We've got to let them go. This is not a good deal. This is not good for us. You'd think somebody would say that, but nobody did. Finally, God came and He said, alright, I'm going to take your firstborn son. And sure enough, you know the story. All those that put the blood on the, on the lintel and on the doorpost and on the lintel, all of those that did that, the angel of death saw the blood and passed over as a, as a picture and an illustration of what our Lord does for you and me when we are covered with the blood of Jesus Christ. But that awful night Pharaoh lost his firstborn son, that's how God built them at the first. How did God build them at the first? He brought them food twice a day, six days a week, while they were wandering in the most awful, one of the most awful deserts in all of the world. That's how He built them at the first. What does God say? He says, I want to build you. I mean, your sin has torn you apart. 
You had a mighty civilization. You had so much, but you gave it all up for your sin. And now I want you to know that although your sin has just, just wrecked you and your, and your city is literally about to be broken apart, it's not going to be built again for centuries. And, and yet, all of those things are true, but I want you to know, in my heart is a desire, Jeremiah. You would know this, Jeremiah, until you pray. But in my heart is a desire to build my, my people again, just like I did at the first. When I was building them at the first, boy, we could go on and on, couldn't we? We could talk about crossing the, 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 the Jordan River on dry ground. We could talk about, well, we could talk about crossing the Red Sea. We could talk about Moses holding up his hands and they defeat the Amalekites. We could uh, talk about all kinds of miraculous things. The sun standing still and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. We could, we could talk about miracle after miracle that God performed. All with the purpose of building His people. But now, as Jeremiah looks at the Lord's people, he says, oh Lord, I just don't know. I mean, Lord, it seems like there's not any hope at times. It seems like there's nothing to be done. I mean, Your people have turned their back on you. They're so wicked. They're so evil. They've, they're, they're so rebellious against you. And God says, no, no, no. Jeremiah, I understand why you would say that. But you just get down on your knees. You call unto me. And I'm going to answer you. And I'm going to show you great and mighty things. You see, I want to build my people just like I did at the first. Wow. Great and mighty things. God wants to recover His people. He wants to reveal His truth. He wants to regather His people. He wants to restore His people. My favorite verses in all the Bible is Joel 2 and verse 25. The context is a terrible agricultural disaster. The crops had been hit by one insect after another. And the Bible says this, in Joel 2 and verse 25, I will restore to you those years that the locust hath eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar. Locust, Canker worm, caterpillar. God calls them my great army. Mississippi today, we have an outbreak of what are called army worms. I don't know if you have army worms here. But cattlemen loathe army worms. Because army worms are they're caterpillars that they get into the ground and in one night they can wipe out an acre of fescue or Bermuda grass. For cattlemen in the south, that's a big deal. I don't know what cattlemen plant up here for, for their pasture. Maybe they don't plant anything because it's prairie, it just grows. I don't know. But I know in the south, when they see the first sign of army worms, they've got to get right on it because you've let the army worms go for a week and they will wipe out acres of pasture. And that, and that similar thing is here in the book of Joel. And the Bible says, yes, those army worms have come through. Those canker worms have come through. Those caterpillars have come through. It's a great army and it's done great devastation. But the, the Bible says through the prophet Joel, hey, you get right with me and I'm going to come to you and I'm going to restore to you the years that this great army has devoured. Some years ago, I, was, I, I had read an article by a couple of people. I, don't, I, don't, I didn't recognize the names, didn't know anything about them. But as I read the article, I found out this man was a journalist and he was married to a medical doctor. And so the journalist was reading something about a, a prison facility in the state of New York. The prison facility, it, it, was, it was reserved for people who are, who are criminals, but they're also insane. The criminally insane. Okay? I can't imagine working at a place like that, but that, that's what he was reading about. As he was reading the article, he was discussing it over breakfast with his wife, the medical doctor. And she made the comment, Brother Jeremy, she said, well, oh yeah, she said, I'm familiar with that. She said, of course... All of those people have a history of marijuana. He said, did you say, of course, they all have a history of marijuana? Oh, she said, yes. She said, that's widely known in the medical community. We understand that, they, that marijuana leads to insanity and, and they have that kind of history. He said, well, I didn't know that. Why didn't I know that? And he was writing about why this is a hidden reality in our culture today. I'm sad to report to you that in the year 2020, my state, the state of Mississippi, voted by referendum on the ballot to legalize marijuana. Now, they call it medical marijuana, but we all know, we all know how that goes. If you've ever been to Colorado, it's, it's an absolute disaster. It came out of an independent Baptist church and some bum passing through had, 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 had a whole stash of weed there. And he stashed it at the Independent Baptist Church just outside the door. 
But that's the culture that Colorado lives in. That's the culture that California lives in. And it's, it's not long. I mean, I've, I've been past fields that are as large as the fields in South Dakota, only they're not growing corn and they're not growing soybeans and, and it's not spring wheat. It's marijuana. I was telling that story to my dad, the story about, of course, everyone at the nut house that has a history of marijuana. My dad looked at me and he said, it's true, son. So what do you mean? You've never been to the nut house. He said, no, it's true that marijuana destroys your mind. He said, I experienced that. He said, as a very young man, of course, if you hear his unshackled story, you'll hear about my dad's story of marijuana. But he said, as a young man, before I was saved, I would get to the place where my mind would just go totally blank for long periods of time. He said, now I'm much older, and sometimes, sometimes your mind goes blank. But he said, it's nothing like it was back then. And he said, after I got saved, I got to the place where, he said, I knew my mind was going. But he said, I went to God, and I just got down on my face before God, and I just began to beg God, dear God, would you restore my mind to me? And then he said, I got a hold of my Bible and started memorizing the Scripture. He said, I'm going to tell you, son, God answered that prayer. He said, God restored my mind to me. Today, my, my dad's mind is pretty sharp. He's taken Faith Bible Institute classes, and it would, it would be a great shock to me if he is not always at the top of the class every single time. But it wasn't always that way. Because sin had begun to come in and that awful effect of sin had begun to destroy his mental faculties. And yet, when he confessed it to God, our God came in and restored the years that sin had devoured. Call unto me. I will answer thee. I'll show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I want to restore them. I want to rebuild them. I want you to notice one final thing. The Scripture says in verse 8, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity, whereby they have sinned against me. I will pardon all their iniquities, whereby they have sinned, and whereby they have trespassed against me. God says, and He says in verse 6, He says, I will recover my people. I will reveal my truth. Verse 7, I will regather my people. Verse 7, I will restore my people. In verse 8, he says, I'm going to remove some things from my people. Notice what he says. He says, I will cleanse them from all their iniquity. Oh, we talked about cleansing last night, didn't we? The Word of God says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I, I submit to you that God wants to remove from His people the grime, the dirt. I want to cleanse them, He says. Uh, here, and again in this passage of Scripture, sin is, is looked upon as so much dirt and so much filth. And we understand the dirt and the filth and it's awful and it's real. But God says, Jeremiah, when you call upon Me, I'm going to answer thee and I'm going to show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. I want to remove from My people that awful grime, that awful filth of sin. I just want to wash it away. I want to make them clean. I want to say one of the greatest blessings of My ministry that by the grace of God has been mine for 19 years is to be able to go and to see God wash away the grime and the filth and, and to see Him restore someone and to see them wash away that sin. What a blessing that is. I want to tell you, if you're a member of the Bible Baptist Church and you know Jesus Christ as Savior, you ought to just get down on your knees and say, dear God, would you do it in our church? Would you do it in our church to build our faith? Would you do it in our church to, to magnify your power? Would you do it in our church to, to, to increase our belief that you can do anything? Dear God, would you come in and do great things? Things. Would you allow us to meet a sinner? And would you allow us to see him saved and see as, as day by day and week by week the grime and the filth of sin is washed away by the power of the Holy Spirit and the sanctifying work that He does. But He says, I want to remove not only the grime, but He says, I want to remove the guilt. Look what He says. I will pardon. Their iniquity. But the word pardon speaks of removal of guilt. Once you've been pardoned, you no longer have to face the effects of your crime. The Bible says here, I want to cleanse them, but
but I'm going to pardon their iniquities. I want to ask you something, my dear friend. Who are you interceding for tonight? Who are you interceding for? Coming to Jeremiah, God says to him, call unto me. Call unto me, Jeremiah. I will answer thee. Jeremiah, I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. And in the middle of this seemingly another message of gloom and doom, God automatically shifts gears. You don't see it coming. It's as if it comes out of the blue and God begins to reveal things that Jeremiah might never have known all because he prayed. In, in my family experience, I suppose I'm what you might call a second generation Christian. That is, my parents... Uh, didn't necessarily grow up in Christian homes, certainly not my mother, but they were saved and then they were married and then they formed a family and and we were brought up we were brought up as, as a Christian home. So I would be what they call a second generation Christian. I do not remember any time that we met for family devotions. I do not remember my mother ever praying in family devotions without praying for her mother to be saved. And when she did so, I don't remember her ever praying for the salvation of her parents without her weeping as she poured out her heart to God. Maybe it happened, but I, I can't remember a time when it did. She wept over in Pastor Forsberg. Every time I remember having family devotions and gathering and bringing our requests as a family before God, she would pray and she would weep over her unsafe parents. Now, you must understand, my grandparents, they're both gone now, but my grandpa... My grandpa was one of the greatest generation. My grandpa was in Patton's Third Army. My grandpa fought through the Battle of the Bulge. He saw his friends blown literally in pieces from German artillery in those wintry months of 1944 and 1945. My grandpa fought in, in, uh, in February and March out of the Bocage of France and into Germany and they, they crossed into, into Southern Europe with the, with the Patton's Third Army. My grandpa was there when they would blow up bridge after bridge after bridge and, and finally the first lieutenant in charge of the tank platoons ordered a halt. General Patton came up and said, what are you doing? Those are not the words he used. They were a little more, a little more dicey words we won't use in church. But he said, what are you doing? The first lieutenant explained the situation. He said, sir, every time we've gotten to the bridge, the Germans have blown up the bridge in front of us. He said, I don't want to lead my platoon halfway across the bridge and have the Germans blow up this bridge. My grandpa was there when Patton ordered him out of the tank and Patton himself climbed into that turret and led the platoon across. And for whatever reason, the Germans didn't blow the bridge. For years, my grandpa lived a life of honesty. He was above board in his business deals. Everyone in the area knew him. He was, a, he was just an honest person. He was a hard-working man and and then came the day when twins were born into his home. My, my grandpa had, had grown up in an orphanage, didn't know his own parents, and so he started a family and, uh, and, and, and everything was going well after he came back from the war. He married his sweetheart that he had known before that he went off to war and, uh, and they, they started a family. Everything looked good on the outside until one day the twins were born. One twin was a, a, a girl by the name of Michaeline. That's my mother. Her twin brother Michael was an invalid. 21 years. The extent of his growth and development as a human being, he grew to about this long. The extent of his growth and development was he could raise himself off the floor and recognize the voice of his siblings. That was it. For 21 years, my grandpa paid and paid and paid every month on the hospital bills that, ha that he had accrued just because of the birth and the subsequent procedures that had to, that had to be done for Michael. After 21 years, the hospital said, Mr. Silvius, you no longer owe us any money. Just, just, just consider the debt forgiven. That'll be all. But deep inside, my grandpa was bitter against God. And that bitterness reflected as a frustration that he had ultimately against God Himself for what he felt God had done to him. That bitterness affected all of the family. They didn't, they, they didn't follow the, the things of God. They didn't want anything to do with the things of God. Until I was out of the house. I was 
off in evangelism, and it was the year 2010, I was invited by Pastor Matt Elliott of the Grace Baptist Church of Plymouth, Indiana, to come and preach a revival meeting there. At that time, my grandpa Silvius was, was he, he wasn't able to get out. He had Parkinson's disease at that time, Parkinson's that would eventually take his life. And I knew that my grandmother had chosen to care for him in their home. I don't know how she did it. She was, a very, she was not a very large woman, she was just a tiny, tiny person, but she was caring for my grandpa. Grandpa Silvius was a big man. He was a big, powerful, strong man. And, and yet, she was taking care of them. So, though they lived very close to Plymouth, Indiana, I did not expect to see either of them. Until, on a Sunday morning, I turned around. Someone had called my name. And there standing before me was my grandma Sylvia, 80 years of age. She and my mother had conspired against me to surprise me at that revival meeting. Now all of a sudden I realized my grandma's here. The lady that we've been praying for all my life to be saved. I preached my heart out that morning. Pastor. She admitted that she was lost. But she didn't move in the invitation. Sunday night came, she was back. Well, that was significant. According to the laws of the state of Indiana, she wasn't supposed to drive after dark. And she was kind of, you know, stretching the laws a little bit. That's very much, very, very much not like my grandmother. She was a stickler for de- she taught her grandchildren manners. There are things that you just don't she was there Sunday night. Again, she admitted her lost condition, but again, she did not move in the invitation. Monday night was the same. Tuesday night, she was there. And, and I preached that Tuesday night, only this Tuesday night. She admitted her lost condition. But then she raised her hand and she said, I need to be saved. She rose from off her seat. 80 years of age, she walked down to the front of that auditorium. I met her there, Brother Jeremy. There at the front of that church where my parents had been married so many years before, I got to lead my 80-year-old grandmother to Jesus Christ. She was 91. I think, I think it was 91. She got to where she would fudge on her age, and so we didn't always... I had to do a lot of math to figure it out. She passed away just before COVID-19 hit this country in a big way what a change we saw in her life in those 11 years. And I will go through my deathbed crediting a praying mother that decided there will not be a time that I do not pour out my heart in intercessory prayer for this woman that means so much to me. Call unto me. And I will answer them and show thee great and mighty things which thou dost know. Father, would you challenge us and you tonight? for the ministry of intercessory prayer. Lord, as I read Jeremiah 33, you pull the curtain back and you show me your heart. Your heart for those people that I care for, that are away from you. Lord, as I read it, and as I endeavor to preach it, it challenges me to return again to the place of intercession. 